Welcome to the Health of Woman podcast. Today is Thursday, May 21st, 2020. In today's podcast, Ending the Quarantine, If, When, and How, Emily Oster and I discuss the current stay-at-home restrictions, how effective are they, and what might be the road to reducing them and returning to normal life, or at least semi-normal. This is a very hot topic and is being actively discussed, debated, and argued by pretty much everyone. There are a lot of opinions, a lot of emotions, and has become very charged politically as well. This is exactly why I wanted to speak with Emily Oster. Emily's an economist, writer, blogger, and mom. She's an expert at data analysis, and she excels in taking large amounts of complicated data and information and organizing and explaining it in a way that regular people, like you and I, can understand. Emily's also very level-headed, thoughtful, and practical, and funny. Emily and several colleagues also recently started a website, www dot explain covid dot org, which we discuss in the podcast. If you don't get that far, today's podcast is one of the longer ones we've done. Please take my advice up front. Go to the website explain covid dot org. It is a data based, understandable source for covid related topics and questions. It is now my first go to website for covid information. I hope you enjoyed the podcast today, and I also hope we can all see each other in person sometime in the near future. We will be back on Monday, Memorial Day, when I interview my colleague, friend, and neighborhood midwife, Lauren Abrams, in We Love Midwives. Thanks again for listening to Health a Woman. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Helpful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Okay, we're here with Emily Oster, professor, writer, parent, blogger. You're all over the place. Emily, thanks so much I'm for all coming over the place. Helpful. <laughs> thanks so thanks much for, for coming. having me. This is, yeah, it's, uh, I'm really happy you're here. I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, as I emailed you earlier this week, I think I agree with everything you say. So this won't be so controversial in terms of an argument. Certainly not all, not all of my interviews start with that. So that's good. <laughs> for those of you who don't know Dr. Oster, uh, Emily Oster is a professor of economics. She was the first guest on the Health Woman podcast related to pregnancy. Uh, it was originally going to be pregnancy in general, because uh, that is a, a world you entered with the books that you wrote, and then it became pregnancy uh, in regards to Corona. And a lot of things we spoke about, you know, four or five weeks ago are themes that are still going on right now. And I was hoping to talk to you about those again, to revisit them, and obviously all the new things you've been doing since then. Sounds great. You know, when we were speaking about this way back when, it seems like six years ago, even though it was like five to six weeks ago, you know, we were talking about sort of this idea of everyone staying at home and quarantine and social distancing, and obviously what is the benefit of that. But on the flip side, what is the possible downside to that? And we spoke about potentially economically. We were talking about with schools closing education and increasing disparities that maybe we see in education amongst kids and also people not going to the doctor for important other visits. And it seems like all of that is, has come about and we're still arguing about these things as a country. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that that we talked about all that stuff. I think that I probably underestimated how costly, sort of how how bad some of those things would turn out to be. And I think the thing I hadn't thought about as as much, but I think is just enormous, is, is the mental health costs on kids, on adults. You know, I think people are really really struggling to just like figure out how to move forward. And I, I think that, you know, not saying that that it was wrong to do this, but I think it's it's worth just, you know, saying like the mental health costs of, of this quarantine period have been really astronomical. It's obviously just the people have more maybe anxiety because of the, the disease itself, because of the infection. And then obviously people not being able to do their routines, a lot of people not leaving their homes not getting fresh air, not getting sunshine, not having human interaction. And the other thing that's so strange is when we do get human interaction, it's different. It's either over a screen or people are wearing masks, which you can't see their face and their expressions, which is really unusual for humans to have that type of interaction. Yeah, I, I think there's those pieces are really weird. I think, you know, I think that screens are not help, helping. You know, I feel like those of us who work, like I'm on the screen all the time. I'm talking to you on the phone. It's like a, it's like a treat. 
uh, <laughs> to not like, I mean, I would love to see you in part, you know, but I like it's the screens are, you know, zooming is really, it's a bit weird. I think the other thing is, you know, somebody asked me the other day, like, do you think this is like early pregnancy, like sort of like early parenting where it's like sort of overwhelming and scary and, and, you know, you don't know what you're doing and you're really uncertain. And I, I think that, that it is like that, but the, the huge difference is that when you are a new parent and you're feeling sort of overwhelmed and like, like, I can't do it. Then you look at you, there's all people out in the world who did it, you know, there's like, okay, I can see the other side. I see that person with a four-year-old, that person's four-year-old like puts on their own pants. Like I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get there. Like they got there. Like I'm going to get there. You know, you have other people who are like, you can do it. Yeah, I know it's hard, but like you can do it just like I did. But this is like, there's nothing like that. You know, it's like, everyone's like, yeah, I don't know. Could it last forever? And people are like, it could be like this forever. Like, well, that, that can't, it can't be like this. You know, it can't be like this forever. Like, and I think that that, that piece of the uncertainty is really weighing on, on people. And I think that's sort of part of it that we don't know how long this is going to last. And part of it is, I think that there's been a very interesting shift in some people's thoughts about this. You know, when this originally started, the assumption was, you know, this is a virus. Viruses spread very quickly through populations. That happens all the time, particularly ones that have a lot of asymptomatic people and asymptomatic carriers. Okay, we get that, but we can't have everybody getting this at the same time because if they do, our hospital systems will be overwhelmed. And not only will there be potentially, you know, very sick people or deaths from this, it'll be compounded by the fact that we won't have enough space to take care of people and more people will die just because they're not getting the, the attention that they need. And so the thought was, okay, we're all going to hunker down and we're going to, that's how the term flattening the curve came flatten out. Flatten the curve. Right. The flatten curve, the curve. Yeah. yeah. The, as we say, the AUC, the area under the curve was going to be the same. The number of people who got infected was going to be the same. It was just going to be drawn out over, let's say, two, three, four months instead of two, three, four weeks. And so that was the thought and it worked. I think it's pretty clear that the hospitals did not get overwhelmed. They're obviously very busy and it was crazy, but they did not run out of resources, which is great. And now people are shifting and you know discussing whether we shouldn't come out because people will just get the virus. And it seems like there's been a paradigm shift that we're trying to avoid anyone from catching this now. That is, that is exactly how it feels. Like we sort of started by like, we're going to flatten the curve. And now it's like, let's try to have no key. And I, I, you know, and I think that that is both basically like impossible. I mean, that seems extremely difficult to to achieve, particularly because all the places that have achieved that have extremely good monitoring technologies, probably much better than we can just realistically imagine. But I, I also think like that's not, you know, the, it sort of misses the recognition, which is, of course, not a nice thing to say, but like, you know, th there is a global viral pandemic. Some people are going to get the virus and some people are going to get very sick with it. And now we know much more. I mean, the other thing that happened is now we know much more about how to treat, which is good. So actually, I think that the survival is likely to be much better, which makes this an even more sort of less productive way to, to switch it. Because now, like, treatment is improving, things are getting better. We should in some ways be like a little more open to the possibility that people will get this because we know how to treat it. And yet it seems like there's, you know, the people who are yelling at my sister-in-law because her two-year-old wasn't wearing a mask at the park. Like that, <laughs> that seems like a little extreme. Yeah. And it's also the, you know, the idea that it's, it's not realistic or maybe like you said, very difficult to achieve to have nobody get infected. And the other issue is part of the solution is people getting infected who wouldn't become very sick from it and developing this herd immunity. So on the one hand, you don't want people who are, let's say someone who's old or has you know, a lot of morbidities and is at risk of really, you know, dying or something horrible happening to them. All right. Definitely don't want them to get it. But people like me, people like my kids who the likelihood of something bad happening is so low, probably the best way to help the people who are elderly and at risk is to get me infected immune so I can't pass it on to them afterwards. Again, assuming that's the case. And, you know, there's a lot of assumptions going on here because we don't know how this virus behaves, but we assume that once someone gets it, they're not likely to get it again and pass it on. And so we're missing that opportunity potentially. Yeah. I mean, I think those those arguments are, you know, I think the sort of flip side of the argument, people would say, well, you know, you could get really sick. Like, you know, if you get it, like, you you know, some people who are like prime age adults do get really sick from this and, and you know, you could die. And so we don't want to run, have anybody run the risk to that. I think that then you want to say, well, you know, that's true of the flu too. That's true of car accidents. That's true of like, we're, we're doing a lot of things in society that 
we're allowing many things to occur, which carry risk of death for 45 year olds, probably much higher risk actually than, than this. And so I think somehow the, the messaging has sort of moved in a place that I think is not super consistent with many of the other choices that we appear to be comfortable making. I mean, you said something, sort of an interesting piece of this, which is the share of the mortality that's in nursing homes. And if you sort of back up and you say like, where do we go wrong? You know, there's like many places that we went wrong, obviously primarily starting with the leadership. But one of the things that has that is true is that in a lot of places, the a huge, huge share of the deaths from this are in nursing homes. And it's pretty clear that if we had started this by shutting, like shutting the doors to every nursing home, then we would have had way lower mortality rates in most places, you know, outside of maybe New York. But like really, like in Rhode Island, it's like 75, 80% of, of mortality is in nursing homes and congregate care facilities. Right, because they're the most susceptible and also they need people to come in and out of their rooms. You can't sell someone nursing home, close your door, right? There are people come in and out. And and also, you know, nursing homes are not hospitals, they're not intensive care units. They can't possibly have all the same protective gear and procedures that you would have in a hospital. It's just not realistic. This is a place where people live. And so yeah. it's a very high risk. And so what I was saying before about protecting them, so one way is to shut the doors, which makes a lot of sense. And so I agree that on an individual level, right, I can look at myself and say, okay, for me, I don't want to take that risk. I don't want to go outside, take a risk getting infected, because as you said, sure, I could get very sick. There's a there's a small chance, and I take that choice. But when we're trying to make decisions based on a population level, like what's the best thing for hundreds of millions of people to do? Well, from a population level, you're best off taking your healthiest, least likely to get sick people, sending them out having them get infected, very few of them would get very sick, similar to like a flu. But then all those people are sort of like, you know, barriers for the people who are really at risk because they're not going to be passing it on to them. And then potentially you could open the doors to nursing homes and have people working there or visiting there who won't get them sick. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we we are sort of we're not that conversation is not happening anywhere. You know, even when we talk about opening college campuses, which I'm pretty involved in here, you know, there's like there's this sort of approach to this to be like, well, look, the colleges will be fine. Like, let's just not worry too much about them. But, you know, and that isn't just to be clear, that's not the approach that um, that we or anyone else is is taking. But, you know, it is an approach that that someone could imagine saying, you know, look, this is like a really low risk population, you know, we sh- we kind of should be having them sort of interact enough to to be infected because that's a group that's not going to have serious, serious illness. So, I mean, I think these are these are sort of very complicated questions. And of course, then one person gets sick and then, you know, you've like, then you're that's very that's very bad. So it's hard to know how we balance these risks. Right. And it's hard to know how much of this is because of the 24 hour news cycle we live in now compared yeah. to before that if CNN put up, you know, every single day someone died from the flu, if they announced it and put it in a banner below. I mean, we would all, I mean, be in a state of terror at all times because I think of this all the time with kids, right? So like there's been this whole discussion about Kawasaki like illness. It's, I don't know, the CDC gave it some new name, people pediatric multi-symptom, like basically examples of kids who have been become very sick from, from COVID, which seems like it, it can happen. You know, it has happened in a small number of, of cases. And, and, you know, people are just like, like panicked. And I keep thinking like, if every time a kid got was hospitalized with the flu, that was the top story, like people would be panicked all the time, they'd probably get the flu vaccine. But you know, every, like every year, a few hundred kids, you know, a couple hundred kids die of of the flu. I mean, that is like, that is a thing that that happens. And it's scary. And it's sad. And it's not something to dismiss. But it's also we're not covering it the way that like every, everything is being like, just the it's in your face all the time. Right. And also everyone's home all the time, just watching the news, right. watching the news. And then yeah. it, and then you're on Facebook and someone posts it. And it's they were talking, you know, about how many lives you would save by everybody staying inside. And also you lose your perspective. So, yeah, you can come up with a number, 10, 20, 100, 1000, whatever it is, you say, all right, we're saving a certain amount of lives. And then, you know, our governor will get on and say, you know, every life we have to save. And I mean, of course, like who's going to disagree with that? You want to save every life. But if the alternative also has costs either in hard numbers of lives lost or, you know, in seriously harming hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And we make those sort of very complicated ethical balances every single day. I mean, people have swimming pools. 
and exactly. people drown. And it's awful. I mean, it's like the most horrible thing ever. But if they put that on the news every day, there would be no more swimming. There would be no more beaches. There would be no more driving in a car or taking a plane or whatever it is because everyone would just be too afraid to do anything. A comparison some people have pointed out, which I think is, you know, perhaps worth thinking about is we're saying like, you know, if even one, like if even one child was going to die of this, we wouldn't, you know, we shouldn't think about opening schools. Well, you know, every year somebody shoots a bunch of kids in a school and like we seem to still open schools and allow people to have guns. And, you know, I, there, like, there's something about that calculus, which feels like we're, we're kind of not thinking about this right. Just to be clear, I think we should have no guns. You know, I don't <laughs> think we should have guns. But I mean, I think there's just like something really not correct about the way we're thinking about this. Right. Just to be clear, Emily Oster is against guns in schools. I am against guns in schools. <laughs> I am against guns. Full stop. I'm against guns. I'm against guns. So no, and I think it's also people, you know, there's also this idea, well, if everyone stayed at home, you know, like you said, maybe that could lead to that sort of social isolation that could maybe produce somebody who would consider shooting up a school. I mean, there's th these these possibilities it's just like once are you endless. go down this yeah. hill, it's endless, right? It's like what you know, like all of these things could could happen, and and who knows what will happen. It's complicated. If you were to take a guess, do you think that right now we've been too restrictive? Just right. On terms of this, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a guess because no one knows for sure. But what does your gut tell you? I'm really not sure, actually. You know, I think that we haven't been smartly restrictive. I think that's that's for sure. I think it was good to to shut everything down for a while. I think we sort of ha had to. I now think it is time to start to reopen some things. Exactly the right way to do that. I'm not totally clear on. So yeah, I don't know what my gut says. I mean, I really actually think my governor is doing a really good job. So I and she's sort of like shut down and now she's reopening. Now she's reopening a bit and kind of dribbling it out a little bit so we can kind of see how things how things go. So I think that, you know, that's not a bad that's not a bad solution. Right. And and there are so many different solutions. I know when, you know, we were emailing before and I was describing sort of my plan. I'm I'm not a governor. I have no authority over anybody, uh, not even at home. But it, it's yeah, I was thinking that you know, the thing that we're concerned about, like I said, with this this curve being flattened, that some of the states and nationally are using data from hospitals to sort of track whether what we're doing is acceptable or not. And if the rate of hospital admissions started spiking again to the point where we may exceed our capacity, then it's time to back off a little bit. But if it's not, and the hospitalizations are sort of staying stable, then we're probably okay. And I think that that is one sort of good piece of evidence we could use to help guide us as opposed to, you know, positive test rates and this and that, which again, is, as you've been preaching forever, really don't mean anything unless you test either everybody or do random testing. Yeah. And then the other thing is, I, I it's see, it seems like there's two ways to open up or three ways. One is just let everyone do everything, which no one's really doing yet. One is to sort of open up, but keep people separate from each other, which I'm not really sure what that means, but okay. And the other is what I was saying is to open up based on risk, like send out your lowest risk people first. And then if everything's okay, send out your next group, working your way up, sort of uh, what I was talking about before, the idea of building immunity amongst a, a population. Uh, but everyone's doing it differently, which is also interesting. It's like 50 different experiments. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think the other thing you can, you can try to do is sort of like, I think a, a smart way to do this involves learning from the things that you're willing to, the things that you do about you know how like what's going to happen for the next phase right so so for example our governor is telling you before we started like the the rhode island has said that they're that they will allow some summer camps to open in some form at the end of june that is like i don't know what they're going to plan to do in terms of monitoring but it feels like that's a place where you learn an awful lot about what's going to happen when you open schools right so you're gonna and it's in like a way low stakes environment like if you end up having to shut down summer camps, it like it's you know that's going to suck. But like that's totally different than having to pull everybody out of school, right? And so, but like then the question is like, what do you what do I mean? Well, I think like we could test test the counselors, test the kids, like you know, pay attention, do symptom tracking, like somehow be like watching what is going on in these camps, and then use that, do that for a month, and then at the end of July, you know, at the end of yeah, at the end of July, you kind of know something about what you might see in in schools and you you could make a similar argument about you know hair salons or 
other kinds of personal um, personal things. You know, those are populations we should be monitoring as we as we open. And those are people you could monitor with. It wouldn't be random testing, but with some kind of we're calling it like sentinel testing. Right, and I totally agree in terms of summer camps. So it seemed to me like camp is the best opportunity because you have, uh, particularly let's start with sleepaway camps. You have an enclosed, defined area. Everyone goes in at the same time. You could choose to test everyone, you know, either with an actual test or symptoms, however you choose to do it, put everyone in. And then really no one goes in or out for an extended period of time. And so it's probably the safest way to have a bunch of people together. And the other thing is, what would those kids be doing if they weren't in camp? They're just going to be running around the neighborhood. They're going to be running around. Into people who they can infect. I mean, if anything, you would, you would want to like hurt up all the kids and stick them together. And this is the way to do it. And as you said, you'll also learn a lot about school. And I think probably day camps are a better assessment of what's going to be like in school because kids come and go rather than sleepaway camps. But I think sleepaway camps are the safest of all the options, followed by probably something like day camps. And we have an opportunity to do that and learn a lot this summer. And honestly, I don't know what these kids would do otherwise. They're not going to stay at home in the summer. No. It's just not going to happen. No, I mean, I told I, I told my kids, like, if there's no camp, like, you're just like, I'm opening the door. I was telling my, my nine-year-old this morning, I was like, if there's no camp, like, I'm opening the door in the morning and like, I'll see you later. <laughs> she was like, she was like, okay, you can ring the bell for dinner. She's reading a lot of Laura Ingalls Wilder. She has some idea that like, she was like, you can ring the bell for dinner and we'll bring our lunch. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> That's sort of like, yeah, when we were growing up, it was like that just, just, you know, after school, you'd be riding your bike on the block back and forth and you just show up when it got dark and that's it. That's the only time your parents heard from you. Right. So maybe, well, maybe we're moving to that, but I don't, something tells me that there's other, you know, something tells me people would be like, why is your kid wearing a mask? What, what do you think about masks in general? I think masks are actually really super important because I think, you know, it is in fact the case that they prevent people from spreading the virus, you know, because you don't, if you have it, you don't cough, but also because I think the much bigger thing is like, you don't touch your face. Right. So like when I, like I, I would wear a mask to protect myself to go grocery shopping, even if it was not required by the store, because like all people, like I touch my face a lot. I guess I prefer not to get the coronavirus. So I think masks are, masks are good. I'm not a fan of like, uh, I think mean, masks are good. Like when you're at a store, when you're maybe close to other people who you, you know, like when you're like in the subway, you know, like in close proximity to people, this thing of like, you should wear a mask when you're running uh, like by yourself or hiking in the middle of the woods. Like th that's not, that's not necessary. And so, you know, and I think in particular, I'm not a fan of mask shaming. So when you're out running and people are like, why aren't you wearing a mask? It's like, I'm not running near you. I, I moved to the middle of the streets to avoid you. And, you know, so I think that, that they're like, we could take it too far. And I think part of not taking it too far is trying to be clear about what the mask is doing and like why, why you would wear it. Right. Well, we have taken it too far So because there, right, there is a lot of mass shaming true. going on. Tons of mass shaming. It's, I mean, I'm, yeah, I made yeah. my son, I made my son wear it into like, I took my son into like the store on the corner to buy fruit the other day when we were out for a walk and I made him wear his like little mask. He's five. He has like a little mask. It has like, it has like um base. My friends, my student's mom made it has like planets on it. It's right. Cute. It's it it has opened up a whole new world of fashion design for <laughs> totally di right. different masks. I mean it's <laughs> it's the same thing. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, I wear a mask in the office uh with patients, you know, they wear masks, we wear masks because, you know, that's also a much it's a higher risk situation. People are more afraid and you know, we're we're we are close to each other and, and everyone's on board with that. That makes sense. And if I go into a store, first of all, in New York the stores require it, so it's not even it doesn't really make a difference. But even if not, like you said, I'm not so worried about myself per se, but I do understand that if, if I'm not wearing a mask and I walk by somebody, you know, I'm wearing scrubs, it looks like I'm a doctor, like that's going to freak people out. And I don't, I don't need yeah. to do that to them. So it's, it's, I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable or scared or, you know, whatever around me. And so I think that's appropriate. It's, you know, it's also this sort of sign, you know, I respect that, that you're concerned about the virus and, you know, we care about each other's people. And I think that's all appropriate, but like walking down the street, it's so weird. Like, why would, you know, like, how is your risk of getting infected any different from if I were sitting in my apartment with the window open? It just doesn't make sense. And so, yeah. and, and this idea that people are suddenly empowered to yell at everybody for not wearing masks. I mean, if people yelled at everybody who, you know, went over the speed limit, there'd be a lot of yelling. I mean, the thing that I find amazing is people who are like, like motorcycling down like this is like boulevard and in, in providence and so there's like you're not supposed to go very fast but like it, it, people drive 
you just driving to road. And the other day I saw some people on their motorcycles going about 60 miles an hour in a 25. They're not wearing any helmets. <laughs> They're wearing masks. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> what, like, what is that? Like, you know, somehow like it's not going to protect you. You're going really fast. <laughs> also, like coronavirus isn't going to get you. Right. Well, wind, gonna... wind burn on the lips can be a big thing. <laughs> exactly. I, if I, I was telling, so yeah, I was telling a friend that if I had any artistic ability, which I don't, I would draw up a New Yorker cartoon and it would basically be a picture of a guy standing on the streets of New York, urinating on the ground and the police coming up and saying, hey, you're not wearing a mask. Yes. I totally exactly right. It's like we've sort of taken it, we've taken it this far. And do you, do you feel the same way about all the social distancing, about being six feet six feet away from people, not allowing people into stores over a certain amount, all the tape on the floor, all of sort of the you know uh, ideas and people saying you know don't go near me, don't go near me. There's like a kernel of something good, like good good there, which is you know. If you were thinking, like when people ask me, like how, you know, I'm going to see like my older parents, like what could I, like what can I do to make this, to make it possible to do that? I think it's, it's good to be able to say, look, if you're kind of far away from, like if you're far away from people and you're wearing a mask and, you know, you don't touch them, then like you can definitely see them. You're not going to get sick. So I think there's a, there's a sort of piece of that, that, that I, I think is, is a good, is like a good messaging because it potentially would let you do things that you would feel otherwise, like maybe you couldn't, you know, I think that the idea that somehow brushing, you know, brushing past someone at the grocery store and your sleeves touch, that that's somehow like, that's how the COVID is getting in, like that is like really vanishingly unlikely. And in fact, you know, when the CDC defines like a close contact, so we're looking at this stuff like what does the CDC say it means a close contact? It's like you're within six feet of somebody else without a mask for more than 15 minutes. Right. It's so a really under that thing. definition, like you really have to be with somebody like you have to you have to be with them. You have to be like talking to them and breathing in their face and, you know, and and so on. And so it's like there's a sort of disconnect from that and the kind of people who are like, who are like, excuse me, I'm in the mango aisle. Like, like, wait for me to be done with the mangoes. <laughs> before you move towards the mango aisle it's like well I, it's it's okay like i'm not you know <laughs> getting your mango not your mango space <laughs> i need my mango space you know and you know it's, what i find so interesting is so you know i'm a physician you 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 do data analysis all the time and you know we're talking about this and we have opinions but you know neither of us know the right thing and we're saying you know we're guessing yeah. we think maybe this maybe yeah. that and but what happens is there's decisions that are being made for massive amounts of people by government. And again, I, I, the intentions are obviously great. I don't think anyone's you know, being nefarious here. I think they're trying to do what's best. But there's now also these like legal challenges to it because the flip side of this is you know, all these restrictions are in actuality removing away liberties that you know, are guaranteed by the Constitution. And so obviously they don't, they don't, they don't you know, exist at all times, right? They're allowed to put up stop signs and tell us I can't drive right through it, even though, you know, in theory, I would have the right to do whatever I want. And so it's a really tough balance between keeping the population safe and not removing liberties. And who has the authority to make that decision? That's what's really being argued. And if it's just one person, well, that's problematic, I would think. And it's going to be argued a lot over the next couple months, I, I suspect. Yeah. I mean, you're already seeing this in some of these places where, you know, the governors and the state legislatures are kind of like having it out over who's who is right. And I think part of what is part of what has happened is like some of the restrictions that people put in early on and did not walk back on were very were like pretty, pretty extreme. You know, so at some point, I think that like the. In, in Michigan, they said, like, you can't go out on your boat and you can't, like, garden. I think people felt like, what, like, gardening, in, like, in my yard, like, what in what sense is that spreading the coronavirus to other people? You know, like, that's not, like, that's, that there's, like, no theory under which that is true. And so then, of course, like, that you you sort of lose the good messaging there, right? The idea that, like, you shouldn't just, you know, go, like, to a beach party. Right. with everybody that you've ever met and like lick their faces, right? So somehow like we sort of got into a place where people stopped listening to the good stuff because they were sort of occupied by the the, the sort of crazy, 
the crazy versions and then the legislature comes in. And so I think we're going to see a lot of a, a lot of arguments or dis disagreements. I don't know, like how I would put it, like a lot of litigation about who is actually in charge. Yeah, is I the mean, state, is the federal, is the city. Reasonable people sort of understand the need for someone to have the ability to put the, you know, put the brakes on certain things in order to keep people safe. But the question is exactly how that's done and who does it. I think everyone disagrees on. And it hasn't, I mean, these things aren't really worked out because these things don't happen so often. And usually everyone's going to agree with certain things. But once it starts getting, you know, like you said, the the, the details people disagree on, number one, they're going to argue it. And number two, like you said, they're going to sort of lose some of the other bigger picture things because we're thinking about all those smaller details and it'll lose its, its effectiveness. I remember you said this at the very beginning, if you tell everyone to stay home all the time, it just won't work. You have to sort of give people something that's realistic in order for them to follow that because it's it's usually all or none. Yeah. And I think we also have to be careful about like like aligning the messaging. Right. So there was like so at, at some point, this, the city of Providence and the state of Rhode Island, which are just to be clear, like like th this is not a big place. They had different rules about parks. And the city said that like city, you know, the, the governor said you couldn't like use your you couldn't bring your car into parks but you could walk around them. And the city decided that you shouldn't be able to walk in parks. And then it was sort of, people were like, well, like why, you know, what is it about, you know, what, like, what does she know that he doesn't, you know, what does he know that she doesn't know? Like what, like, why are they disagreeing about this? And I think the answer was like, nobody had any particular idea about whether that was safe or not safe and how to, and how to organize that. But, but, you know, that kind of disconnected messaging across states between, you know, municipalities and states between businesses or, you know, firms and states or cities like that makes it really hard for people to parse what's going on. Yeah, and we had that in New York. I mean, there was New York City, New yes. York State, the CDC, then there's you know New Jersey and every community and their departments of health were saying different things. The messages have gotten more aligned over the past six weeks. I think at least in, in our region, it's gotten better. Up at the beginning, it was really very different and confusing. I mean, if, you know, one Department of Health said stay at home for two weeks. Another one said stay at home for a week. Other one said you're fine to go out. And you're like, huh? <laughs> it's like, right. what do I do? It's very strange. And I, one of the other things we spoke about, which really, you know, came to light was this idea of people not getting regular health care because they were too afraid yes. to leave their homes. And I mean, I think that's been a real problem. Yeah, I mean, we've seen like, you know, even like ER visits in uh, in Rhode Island have been down like 50% or something. I mean, like, you know, people are not even like, even because even though there is a, a viral pandemic, ER visits are still down like a huge share. But yeah, and people are, you know, people are not vaccinating their kids, because they don't want to go in for a well visit, you know, people are not getting kind of surgeries that really we would consider like, maybe they're not essential, but like, they're pretty you know, they're pretty important. Yeah. Preventative care is a huge one. I mean, you're talking about a two to three month break in preventative care. And again, most people who go for their preventative care checkups, their well visits, whatever are fine. And so, yeah, for them, it doesn't matter if they waited three months, but what if you do have breast cancer and it's picked up the difference in picking it up March 1st and June 1st could mean a difference in survival and treatment and staging or colon cancer or heart disease or whatever it might be. And those, how to add that to the calculus, you won't know for five to 10 years potentially. And I think that people have to be mindful of that when they're coming up with these restrictions and whatnot and how to incorporate that into the loosening of restrictions. You know, prenatal visits are limited. You know, people are not getting early prenatal care because they don't want to go to the doctor. In OB, one of the, you know, pregnancies go on, you know, no matter what. And so people do come, definitely people come less than they may have. We certainly had people who said, uh, you know, we normally want them to come in and they didn't. And we tried to, you know, do some sort of virtual visit or do something over the phone and just to figure it out. And it, it's been, I think, okay in the OB world because I, I just think pregnant women figured out, what am I going to do? I, I don't have a choice, but certainly for gynecologic care. You know, yeah. the people aren't coming in and for other, you know, I, you know, my colleagues and friends who are doctors, their offices are shut down and these are people who do important stuff. It's not, you know, yeah. and, and they're just, they're, they have no patients coming in and that's, that's probably not, a, I mean, it's not probably, it isn't a good thing for the patients. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about 
what you are doing about this. So one of the things that you know I really adore about you is not only do I like talking to you and you know it's just you're so interesting, but you also are someone who acts and you try to get information out there. You do research. You know, you collect the data, you analyze the data, you think about the data, you know, you sort of distill it and put it out in a way that people can understand it, and then you bring it out to people, So, which is what you did for pregnancy, which is how we first met, which I thought was awesome, as you know. And now you are all over this, you know. All over COVID. <laughs> You're all over COVID. And you have a website that you and others started, which is www.explaincovid.org. So tell me about that. What prompted you to do this? I mean, I've been thinking a lot about COVID, like we all are. And, you know, it's at some point, my um, a friend of mine basically called and was like, look, I think that there is a dearth of information about how this is actually working, like a dearth of like scientific knowledge among people. And the people who do the good science are not good at explaining the science. Like they, you know, when you put the, the science people on like the sort of immunologists, like virologists, the people who are like actually doing the cutting edge stuff, when you put them on TV, like they can't really explain what they're doing in a way that people can can understand. And so the the voices are going to the sort of voices we're hearing are people who don't really know everything that's going on. There's a lot of inform the misinformation. There's just a lot of like misunderstandings. You know, the example I always give is I think that, you know, there are definitely people who think like if you go to Whole Foods and someone has COVID and they have touched a salad box and three weeks, you know, three hours later you come and you touch that salad box that you die for sure. Like that seems to be like <laughs> some of like some there are people it's sort of like that's not that's not that's reflecting like among other things a sort of poor understanding of how like the virus operates and so she said you know like i think like can i partner you know it seems like this is a thing that that you do which is like explain try to explain science to two people that's like my thing she said you know can i partner you with this person at like at least introduce you to this person at, at uh his name is galit alter who's the professor at who's at mgh and she sort of is doing like kind of cutting edge stuff and has a big lab and does all kinds of stuff about serology serological testing so we started talking and then sort of very quickly got to like okay let's just put something together that's like a super simple like if you go to the website it's just like black and white text <laughs> um and so but it's really just trying to like explain in a way that hopefully people can understand you know, like, what is the path of the virus? Like, what has to happen for you to become infected, to become exposed, you know, exposed to be infected? What happens if you get sick? How does it work? You know, how can you get it? And then sort of using things like that into the, into move into the questions of why would you need to wash your hands? Well, let's, let's, now that we understand a little about the virus, like, let's, we can now understand why it would be important to wash your hands and in what situations you could wash your hands. And so, so the website is kind of like has a bunch of these sort of long form explainer things that I like about different topics. And then is also at the moment, we're trying to sort of pivot a little bit and have more kind of content to help people process the like incredible amount of information that is coming in, in every at every minute. So to sort of take some piece of something you've read in the news, like here's a new kind of test and say, you know, here's what you read and here's what, you, you know, here's the material you can read. If you'd want to understand, you know, is this a big innovation? Is it a small innovation? What's the context for it? So we're trying to do some more of that, and you know, just like really get sort of good information, good information out there. It's so important. First of all, I'm, I, I love the website. I have no royalties here. I have nothing. I, I just go on the website. I, I really enjoy it. And I think the important aspects of the website are number one, as you said, it's clear, like it's it's understandable. It's written for regular folk. It's this is not high. It's not high jargon. It's not high medical. It's not dumbed down. It's it's just regular as you would want it to be explained in a very straightforward fashion, which is important, obviously, like you said, not everyone can do that. And so the fact that you're able to do that and people can read it and understand is great. But number two, it's not just an opinion, right? This isn't, you know, what does yeah. Emily think about COVID? You're talking about, okay, here are the studies that are out there. Here's what we know. Here's how the studies are good. Here's how the studies are flawed. You know, what are the things we know? What are the things we don't know? What are the things that we think we know? And try and put things into context so people can understand where, where this is coming from, that it's not just, oh, hey, I think this, and I'm going to write it down in a way that people understand. It's actually based on data, again, because that's sort of what you're living and breathing, which is great. And the other thing is, it's probably at least what I found, the best place to go is sort of the, the front lines for how to understand something. Because, you know, if you get something from a news website or a news piece, you know, on, you know, on the radio, or on the television, it's always, you know, meant to, 
either entertain or to, you know, you know, sort of scare or whatever it is to get people's attention. You don't really get that. If you go to the real hardcore science, like you said, it, it's sort of out of context. You don't understand what's going on. And it's hard to read. And so, for example, like I have a lot of people are asking me now about this, you know, Kawasaki like illness in yeah. kids. And what do I think about it? And, you know, I can tell them what I think about it. But, you know, so what I went on today is I went to your website and I pulled up that page at you and you explain it. And I was like, this is exactly how I explain it to people. And this is where I'm going to tell them to go like, read this. It'll explain what it is. It'll explain why it's important. It'll put it into context in terms of is this really something we should all be, you know, burying ourselves in our backyard because of or not. And it's just the best way to get that as opposed to just typing it in Google which you can, you know, can lead you down very scary rabbit holes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That is that is good. That is what we're going for. I'm, you know, I think part of what has been sort of interesting for me about this is when I write, you know, when I write my books or like the, when I write my newsletter, there, it's not that those things are my, are my opinion, but they are much more my sort of voice and their material that I am myself like even sort of more comfortable with. In, in the case of, of this COVID stuff, actually, there's a ton of like, much of the team is made up of like experts and so my role is a much more translational role so like when we put together that kawasaki thing i have like a slack channel of like people with basically who are doctors and phds and you know postdocs and all you know professors whatever and i was like okay this, you know this is the entry we're doing like everybody tell me like what what are we saying you know what are we saying about this Right. And then people like tell, you know, like everybody's kind of arguing, whatever. And then, you know, I kind of pull it together and then I send every like, okay, here's the Google Doc and everybody sort of tries to edit it. And and so it's been it's been a really interesting to me to try to fulfill that translation rule while actually having other people produce a bunch of the sort of a bunch of the of the content and, and sort of give me the science and then have me translated it's been kind of it's been kind of fun right because like you said you're not a, like a you're, not, yeah, you're not a virologist or an immunologist right. i mean and you're, I'm not an, you're an, OB, an economist like yeah i'm not an ob either <laughs> fyi um but you know with the with the pregnancy stuff partly like i had a, a, a much longer of course i had ob's that like helped on that also but i had a much longer time and those books are written like the books are written much more as a sort of like here sort of like here is like a through my here is some in the data that sort of comes through my experience whereas the the COVID stuff is much more like, you know, I don't have any, I haven't had COVID that I know of. And, you know, this is sort of just like, here is how a virus works. Right. It's a viron, it has this stuff on the outside. It's like, I mean, I feel like I've been like telling my daughter all about this. She was like, that's not that. <laughs> I don't know. She was interested for like a few days. <laughs> like, okay, we talk about something else. What right. about Pokemon? And it's also different because, you know, when you wrote your books on pregnancy and on parenthood, you're, it's more of a sort of a comprehensive dive into things that a lot of people have studied and you're putting it all together. But for you know the COVID stuff, everyone's doing this on the fly. This, the data that's coming out is all fresh. It's all new. We don't have old data on this or you know, old studies. I mean, the oldest studies we have are from you know, China from two months ago as opposed to from two weeks ago. And that's it. Yeah. And so, and so, no, and the yeah. big, basic facts are like impossible to get, right? Like we're writing this Kawasaki kids thing. And I was just like, okay, let me try to figure out how many people like right. have that. no no idea like whereas you know when you do pregnancy like i can complain like oh you know this study isn't as good as i would like but at least i know like how many people are in the study <laughs> like that i can learn it's it's really hard i mean i'm one of my roles you know academically is i'm an editor for for an ob journal and they have this sort of rapid review process that they're doing for covid related submissions because normally from submission to publications you know five months or this or that and obviously people want the data out sooner but they want it reviewed and you know do all this stuff so we're just sort of decreasing the time that it takes to review these papers and you know do peer review and whatnot and so when i there's so many submissions that are coming in and when i look at them part of the problem is like okay we have this many women but what's the denominator right so how do you even know that like if it, a study that looks at hospitalized women it's going to make it seem like everybody's sick because right. everyone was in the hospital to begin with. And we don't have that big population data yet to really understand percentages and risks and whatnot. And I don't know if we'll ever get that. Uh, hopefully we will, but we certainly don't have it now. I mean, the thing that's really hard about the about, you know, about that sort of like almost it's like I think of it as like a missing denominator problem. Like we, we kind of know how many people are seriously ill. We know how many people who die, who die of this. We don't have any idea how many people have it. And so we don't know what number is on is on the bottom. And so when we're thinking about, you know, some of the kinds of questions about how risky should people feel that they that they are like, you know, that this like you don't know what the case fatality rate. Right. Uh, rate is. And so 
It's 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 hard. How, so so how many people are on your team with the websites or the main group of people? It's like I don't know, fifteen. I mean, all all in like fifteen or something. But they're they're kind of like there's a bunch of undergrads. There's some like post. There's a bunch of different people. They sort of come come in and out. That's great. And how is how has the response been thus far? I mean, do do you track anything like that? Like you know, yeah, hits yeah. We tried. Or... We had like yeah, we had like four million page views the first day. That was good. Wow. Um, so wow. yeah, I mean, I, I was doing... I was three million of them. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. It's like I mean, I think we're doing good. I think we could do. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out how we can do more to get people to sort of to, to get this to be a place that people go so i don't know we're talking to some different like i need like a strategic somebody told me this morning i need a strategic communication firm that is um so <laughs> i guess i'm gonna need to find that but you know i think it's been i think it's been it's been good i'm hoping that i'm hoping that things like this will help people get the word out here's i'm doing my strategic communication right now yeah <laughs> I uh, yeah, for all, all four million of my listeners, they'll they'll all hop on. Exactly, right now. exactly. Uh, no, but really, I I do strongly recommend it. ExplainCovid.org. It's a great website. It's it's just what people need to understand what's going on. It won't necessarily answer every question about what to do, but at least we'll all be coming from this, you know, from the same place and understanding what's happening. And you're you're a busy bee. I mean, you're really you're doing a lot of stuff. I mean, you still have a job and you still have kids and you know, they're at home with you and you're doing all yeah. of this. How do you have the time for all of this? You know, it's been a little challenging, but it's, you know, it's good. I mean, partly like a lot of things have, have been overlapping. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of stuff about COVID at my job. So now I'm actually the co-chair of the Healthy Reopen Task Force at Brown. So I oh. have like, I'm like one of the people in charge of like figuring out how we're going to bring the students back to campus. And so actually learning like learning a lot about COVID is become sort of my job. So that's been that's been good. I think the biggest challenge I'm having actually is balancing the work with the kids. I think if my kids were not here, I would it would be <laughs> would be fine. <laughs> and if um, only, if I, if only I didn't have those kids, I'd have plenty of time. Right. No, no, I like the kids. You know, I'm look, I'm a fan of the kids. Don't get me wrong. But you know, it's been I like I you know, running sort of homeschool for for the kids while I think we're while doing this stuff has been has been tricky. I think we all have a little homeschool we all have a little like school fatigue and screen fatigue. You know, I just got a text from my nanny saying that my daughter wants to stay outside in running in the sprinkler rather than go inside for her like end of the day Zoom meeting with her class. <laughs> and I was just like, yep, that's fine. You know, like it, it, we got to like, it's the first day it's above 75 degrees. Like I got to let my kids run the sprinkler. And I know you're also writing pieces for news outlets. That you had an article this week in the Washington Post, again, about summer camp, which we discussed before in your you know, your thoughts on how we probably should be opening summer camps and using them as A, a way to put our kids somewhere and B, to learn about what it's going to be like for schools. Did you get a lot of responses? I imagine you may even got some angry responses from people over that piece. A lot of happy yeah, ones I from did. parents. I'm, yeah, it was, it's sort of, the the reactions are kind of interesting. I mean, I think that I did get a lot of people who I think agreed, agreed with that basic premise that we should, you know, we should open camp, sort of desperate. I would say desperate parents who are in my space. And then I think there really are. I mean, there are a lot of people who really think we should not be doing any who doing any reopening and that, you know, we should really like plan to kind of stay hunk, hunker down like this until, you know, until there's a vaccine. And, you know, I think that is a that is a, a position that that one could have. And, and those people definitely do not, you know, they definitely think that I want to kill people. It's so hard. And everyone has their own opinion, obviously. And, you know, it's just it gets very emotional and this idea that someone who you know thinks we should be reopening whether it's schools or camps or economy or whatever that somehow these people are you know just in it for money or their own interests or they don't care about people or they want to kill people it's just it's really just not fair it's not right and on the flip side you know people who you know are advocating that we should be you know staying at home and doing all these things that they don't care about poverty or whatever, you know, people being out of work and this, I think that's also not fair. I think people are scared. And when people are scared, they make decisions sometimes that aren't as rational as they normally would. And even if they are rational, it's very hard. They get, they get emotional over the alternative opinion if you're scared. Yeah. And I think that they, you know, it's, it's, I think it is the, the fear the fear aspect of this is driving a lot of people. And I think there is in some ways a big distinction between people who are, who are really like afraid themselves of getting the, the virus and people who are, you know, not that anyone wants to, but sort of less like 
experiencing less personal fear about that, whether it's because they're in a lower risk group or whether it's just that like, you know, people differ in their in their reaction to this. And I think that is coloring a lot of people the way that people are are interacting with with this. Right. I think the other thing is, you know, pe- like some people find this e- easier than easier than others, either because of the way their personality is or because of, you know, their personal circumstances or, you know, whatever it is. Like some people for some people, this is, you know, staying at home until January is kind of annoying, but like whatever. And for some people, it's like that's, you know, that's the difference between like, you know, having a job and not having a job or having a place to live and not having a place to live. And, you know, th- those are those are big differences. Yeah, I mean, that's crucial when 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 people get on the air and say, you know, s- you know, stay at home, it's it's just an inconvenience. Well, yeah, it's an inconvenience for a short amount of time, but at a certain amount of time for for many people, if not most people, the vast majority of people, at a certain point, it becomes a real devastation because if you don't have a job and you don't have income and you can't pay your rent or whatever it is, you can, like you said, you couldn't put food on the table. You can't, you know, live somewhere. You can't, you know, buy things for your family, clothes. And it's it's a really big deal. It's not an inconvenience for some people. It, it could be life and death yeah. for some people. And it's just, it's people have to be very careful about the judgments of the, you know, the other side of the coin and a what their you know what their intentions are and sort of what they're thinking and also really what does it mean to them it means a lot of different things to different people yeah yeah i mean it's not you know people who are who are kind of out doing jobs it's not because they want other people to get to get covid i mean that's it's, you know it's you gotta have a job to have to have a life right basically and then the the other piece that you had this week, which I really liked in the Atlantic, this idea that you know this this all or nothing stay at home, uh, which we also spoke about, that you wrote that it it backfires because it actually can work negatively. And can you just explain that what you what you were talking about in that article? Yeah, so I think the point I was trying to make there is that you know when we tell people like you know we tell people something as extreme as sort of like stay at home, don't you know don't go out. Like, you know, make sure if you go out with your two year old, make sure they have a mask, you know, shaming people about doing this, that that, that messaging is so ex- extreme that um, that, you know, you you we are going to get to a point where people feel that they just can't do that. And if we haven't provided them with a sort of more nuanced message of like, you know, there's kind of the first best, maybe the safest thing is to stay home. But, you know, if you're going to go out here, there are sort of more and less safe ways to to do it. If we don't give them access to that kind of nuance in, in the messaging, I think we run the run the risk that people will just kind of go out and do whatever, right? So the example I give in the article is like if you tell people, well, it's really not even safe to like, you know, walk down the street with your friend at, you know, six feet apart while you're wearing a mask, like it's best to just, you know, stay home. Then people may well be like, well, why don't I just have all my friends over? Like I'm never, I'm not going to not see people. So I'm just going to have everybody over for a barbecue without masks and we're just going to like touch each other because you know i can't do I, I can't do the thing you've told me i can do and i don't know how to decide between the other things and you know that's a sort of extreme example but i think we're we're risking the we're risking not providing people with information to go out safely by spending so much of our time telling them to to not go out at all and particularly as we reopen and places start to to kind of reopen, we need to move the messaging to a place where people can go out as safely as possible, recognizing that, you know, once people start going out, like some people are going to be infected with the virus. And we said that at the beginning, like, that's going to happen. And that's something we're going to have to, you know, deal with. And the hospital system is in a much better position to deal with it now. Right. And you gave a good example that you gave regarding parenting and, and sleeping the, your baby, what position to sleep in, the idea that if you, you know, you know, sleep baby in a crib on their back is the best. But if you don't give any other, you know, nuances to that, they'll say, well, if I can't do that, I'll just, you know, put the kid in this position, which is going to be the worst one. Yeah, exactly. That like, we, you know, people may find themselves in a situation where they basically, or, you know, they basically feel like they can't, like, if you tell me like, you can't have your baby in, in the bed with you, they have to be in the crib. That's the only thing. If it, if you think like, I, I, but I just can't do that. My baby won't sleep there. And like, I haven't slept in three days and I, I have to do something. You know, we, we get people sleeping in much less safe situations, maybe falling asleep with the baby on the sofa, which is much worse than, than sharing the bed. So I think we, you know, we, there, the same kind of thing applies. Like we need to do messaging that, that helps people understand the, the scope of the trade-offs. And, you know, if you can't do the thing we're telling you is the safest, what is the next best thing to do? For the last thing I want to ask you about is, 
let's say you were in charge of the whole thing, right? The, you know, all the governments called you up and said, Emily, you are our Corona czar. It's you. You make all the decisions. How would you envision reopening, you know, ending the quarantine, you know, if we should do it, when we should do it, how we should do it? What would be the best way that you've come up with in your head? I'm pretty focused on, I would be pretty focused on, on te- like testing, monitoring, using testing in a smart way to try to figure out how our reopen is, is going. And so I think that would be a big piece of it. I think the, the piece that I would have drawn from your, um, from, from what you, what you, the ideas that, that you sent me at, at some point is the, is the issue of sort of like opening up for lower risk groups first, which I think is some of what's happened in, in Europe. So, you know, I would be pretty aggressive about opening stuff for kids and for and for young people again you know with a fair amount of monitoring of how it's going i would do that you know way before i would open nursing homes so i think the, those are sort of the two pieces that i would be kind of most focused on but you know i think it's a hard i mean it's a it's a hard problem that i sort of see because i interact with the state a lot in with with rhode island you know how do you kind of restart the economy that that is tricky and you know it's going to be memorial day we're all like interested like the, everyone's like very 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 pressuring the governor to open beaches for Memorial Day. But once you open beaches, like everybody's going to be on the beach. Right. It's going um, to so, be like the scene from Jaws, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> what they decide, do we open the beach or this big shark in the water? Yeah, we're going to open. Everyone wants to go. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like, oh my yeah, God, no, and we I did think, this in a movie um, once. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think this is a little bit like, this is a little bit of what has been sort of tricky about the kind of this, this total shutdown that we that we engaged in that you sort of you're you've made people crazy to like do anything which means as soon as you as you you know as soon as you open people are gonna like you know you run the risk that people are gonna kind of like go go bananas right um, two, two, so, two weeks ago this was gonna kill people and now it's fine but that's where we are we gotta like figure out how to move, move from there wow well listen i i, I totally agree this is this is complicated stuff, and I don't know where we're going to be, what we're going to do. I, you know, I have opinions about this also, but you know, whatever. My opinions are my opinions, but I do think that the what, you know, people can learn so much from getting good information, which is why I'm so I'm always so happy to talk to you and to have you on because you do really excel at taking information that's complicated and that's vast and putting it into a way people can understand it and really learn something from it. And you do that in your books, you do that in your articles, you're very level-headed, and your website, again, you and others, explaincovid.org, is a fantastic resource for all of us to use. And I really thank you for doing it and for putting the work into it and for trying to help all of us get through this in the safest and most reasonable way possible. And I obviously look forward to continue to talk to you about this. Hopefully not forever. We can maybe go back to pregnancy at right. some point. I would love to go back to pregnancy, <laughs> but uh, but I'd also, you know, I always like to, I always like to talk. So it's always a treat. Stay safe, you and your family. Thank I you, hope, you too. Yeah, I hope summer works. I hope you get to go to summer camp and, oh my you gosh, know, enjoy. <laughs> we'll be in me touch. Me too. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.